Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk, continuing on in search of Christianity as we continue to look in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so we're joined today here at their house by John and Lynn Bonacoro, your old friends Hi. and brother and sister. And of course you all know Alice. It's me. And I'm me. And uh, as I said, we're continuing on. Last week we were doing... We're, we're in the Beatitudes, and we're looking at blessed are the poor, pure. Not, <clears throat> blessed, are, blessed the are the pure. pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we're going to continue on with that portion, that, that, that verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 today. Um, before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother John if you will just ask God's blessing on our time here today. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to get in the Word with you and to be attentive to what you're telling us, Lord. We just thank you for your blessings, Father God, that uh, everyone arrived here safely, that we're in good health, and being blessed daily by your presence. And we just praise you and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, you know, I said when we started this whole thing, this started this In Search of Christianity, and then again when we started our look at the Sermon on the Mount, that this is radical Christianity. But radical in the true sense of the word, which is the root. We're getting back to the root of Christianity. Because that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. This is Jesus is teaching on what we are to look like, how we are to live, what we should look like. This is, everything else in the Bible is basically either prelude or commentary. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, but this is the core. This is the core. This is absolutely the core of what true Christianity is. And it is going to seem radical to, to a, lot of, a lot of people, okay? Because we have drifted, and that's how we started in this In Search of Christianity. We have drifted from the teaching of Jesus Christ, okay? And now we need to get back to that place. So let me start with this. We're talking about being pure in heart. A scribe came to Jesus when he was teaching, and he said to him, What is the foremost command? Right? Mm -hmm. What's the most important commandment? And Jesus answered, and this is Mark 12, 29 and 30. Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It starts, what's the most important thing? What's the most important command from God? The first thing he says is you should love the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. Now, purity, we, and I, I mentioned this in our last week, but I want to just reiterate this because it's important. We have to understand what it means to be pure. The dictionary definition, which is, purity is being free from anything of a different, inferior, or contaminating kind. It's being free from extraneous matter. Okay? Purity is being free from foreign or inappropriate elements, free from moral taint or defilement. Okay, that's what purity is. There's nothing, purity is not about, you know, what you're not doing. Purity is about things that you have in you that you shouldn't have. Something that's impure is, you know, there's stuff there that shouldn't be there. And it's, it's, it really is that simple. And we're talking about purity, then we're talking about holiness, you're talking about sanctification, because they're just locked hand in hand. Finger and finger in this case, right? So remember, this is about being pure in heart. Because that's what okay? God says. Because a lot of people, when they begin to focus on it, it's like, oh, are you being pure in the way you dress? Are you being pure in the way, the way you eat? Or you being... It's about what's in your heart, right. right? For with the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness. That's what Paul wrote in Romans 10.10. 10. Mm -hmm. You believe in your heart. It's not what you believe in your head. You may reason things in your head, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's what's in your heart, okay? 
So that, when you, if you have, if you've been saved, and you've been given a new heart, that's what it said in Jeremiah, then that has to result in godly speech. He said, for with the heart man believes, but then he says, with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So it is two-part. I mean, you've got to believe it in your heart, but then you have to confess it with your mouth. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, let a man examine himself. And we did, we did a series, of book, one of the books that I'm be coming out with really quickly is called um, The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. If you've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, there has to be evidence in your life. Jesus said you'll know, you'll know them by their fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to examine ourselves. The question I have to ask myself, and I encourage you to ask yourself, am I pure? Am I holy? That's a reasonable question to ask yourself if the Word of God says examine yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. So now, I don't. if I'm going to examine myself, I don't look at the outward appearance because that's not the imitation of God. He doesn't judge by outward appearance. That's what it says in the Word. He searches the heart, all right? Now, the thing is, I can't see my heart as he does. So I have to listen to my heart to find out what fills it. Because it says, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, that which fills the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart is what's going to be in your mouth. Okay? So I, I, well, I can't see my heart. I can tell you. I can examine myself and I know what's in my heart. If all I ever talk about is baseball, I'm going to tell you that's what fills my heart. Okay? okay? Mm -hmm. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If my heart is pure, then my speech will be free from extraneous manner. My heart, my, my conversations will be free from foreign or inappropriate elements. Yes. My speech will be free from different, inferior, or contaminating things. And that's the measure. If, I, if I'm striving, I want to be, you know, the Word of God says that we should be perfect even as He is perfect. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. All right? If I'm striving for that, if I desire, that's my desire, is to be more and more like Jesus, who is perfect. Right? Yes. Then think about what James wrote. James 3.2. He said, for we all stumble in many ways. Listen, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bride the whole body as well. James 3.2. If you don't stumble in what you say, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Because it's an indication of what's going on in your heart. It's an indication of what you believe. We had a dear friend in Wales who passed away a couple of years ago, Arthur Burke, at 102 years old and still traveling and preaching. And he used to say, what a man believes rules him. Now, I believe, with, I believe fully, I am convinced that what you believe will determine your choices. That will determine what you, what you choose to do, what you choose to say. And what you choose will determine your life. You make choices. Listen. You know, you have no excuses. We do things. We're, we're responsible for the things we do. And Jesus said, you are responsible for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. That's what's in your heart, all right? Also, let no unwholesome okay. word proceed See from you. I mean, there, oh my goodness gracious, there are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures about this. And it, it really is so important because it's, this is not positive thinking. Yeah. It's not trying to create things by what you speak. It is about agreeing with God. So you come into that place of agreement, then you start walking in the fullness of the word. Right? What do you often what do you most often talk about? Right? And, and you know, I, I promise you, I've said this a thousand times, so I'll say it a thousand and one. I promise you I don't say anything for judgment. What I'm saying I say for encouragement. The word says, examine yourself. What do you talk about the most? Because that's that is what's in your heart. It reveals the abundance of your heart. Then let me go back to where we started. The highest command, the foremost command, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now that that's what's radical, because this is what this is this is okay. Well, you know, I, it's part time. Christianity is not part time. Following Jesus Christ, being led by the Spirit of God, that's not a part time occupation. It is full time. David, listen, David, a man after God's own heart, he was quite the sinner, don't you know? But he also had a heart that was always quick to repent. And he prayed, create me a clean heart, O Lord. 
He trusted in God to do that work in his life. And that's what we need to be. We need to know, you know, we can't do this on our own. No. But we can choose to surrender to God who is doing the work in our lives, okay? And it's something that we should pray daily because we get contaminated every day out in the world. Because that's a sewer out there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's sad to say, but it is absolutely the truth, yes. okay? So that brings me to this statement that I want to make. True Christianity is a consuming obsession. You know, for what, what, what has happened over the, the centuries, over the millennia, is that Christianity has basically been become uh, a, a comfortable. We've developed a culture of comfort in Christianity by adding things to our life that are comfortable. That's, that sounds nice. We're, we're creatures of comfort. Yeah, that said, if we have as the song says, decided to follow Jesus, you better remember that if we claim to follow the King of Kings, who chose to come as Ebed Yahweh, the servant of God, the suffering servant, that's what it says in Isaiah over and over, right? He who was born in a manger and later said, the foxes have dens and the birds of the air have, have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, right? He was called insane by his own family. You know that? His own family said, he's lost his senses. The religious leaders said, he's demon-possessed. This is the one that we've chosen to follow, right? He was, he was mocked by the world, executed as a common criminal. And we're to imitate him. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. That's what it says in Ephesians 5.1. He did all those things, but you know what he did? He always, always was perfectly serving the will of God, his Father. Because he didn't do or say anything that he on hadn't heard from his Father. He didn't, he didn't speak anything on his own. That's what it says in John 12. He didn't do anything that the Father hadn't told him and shown right. him to do. Right? That's right. You know, I, I, there's an old hymn. I don't think it gets sung. Well, I haven't heard it sung a lot more anymore. Maybe you guys want to belt it out just to have a little background to it. Count your blessings. Count your blessings, count them one by one. <laughs> That's nothing funny. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> we are, listen, I thank God for all of the blessings that he's given me. I can't say there's anything wrong with counting your blessings. But I do want to remind you that Jesus said, count the cost. That's what he said, count the cost. Because if you think that there's not a cost in this world to following Jesus Christ, You've missed something, okay? Jesus said, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. That's a very dangerous word. At all. There, in the, in the old, by, by the way, when that man asked, that scribe asked Jesus, what's the foremost command? Jesus quoted scripture to him. He was quoting what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Okay? So in the Hebrew, when it said, you should love the Lord with all your heart, you know what that word all means in Hebrew? All. When Jesus quoted it, and it's in the New Testament, it's in Greek. You know what that word means in Greek? All. All. You can't talk quick. I'll tell you. I know my language. Sure. <laughs> because it's, and now he's saying, you, you can't be his disciple unless you give up all your possessions. Now, you know, that's radical. And it's not something being taught in the church. You know why you have to give up? Because none of them are yours to begin with. God put man in the garden and gave him stewardship over that garden. He never gave him ownership of the garden. Whatever you have from God, he didn't give you ownership of it. He gave you stewardship. The earth is the Lord's, it says in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to him. He entrusts us with things. But he doesn't turn over ownership of them. Okay, so if you understand that, and we did this, you know, that's that's where this whole, and I, I said it was important when we started. This is where the Beatitudes start. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you recognize that you're poor in spirit because none of it belongs to you, that's when you begin to live in the fullness of the riches of Jesus Christ. And as long as you're hanging on to your possessions, you want to know something? You'll always be poor in the natural. Being poor in the spirit will make you rich. You know, I'm not going to redo that whole thing, but it's like 
God says, he will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. When you get to the place where nothing is yours, then you know what? Everything will bless you. And it's not a burden when it's not when you don't have ownership of it. It's not you a burden. You don't have to worry about it. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, it's like, you know, I always use the example of a rental car. Mm. You know, if, if you have a car and you want to take care of it, you don't want anything to happen to it, you want to make you have a rental car, but I mean, you, you take care of it because you have stewardship, so you're responsible for it. But if something happens to it, well, hello, Mr. Avis. You know, yeah. hello, Mr. Hertz. Your car is having... <laughs> well, needs a new engine. You call the owner. Well, if, you're, if, if you believe that this house is yours, mm -hmm. yeah. well, then you know what? You carry the burden. Yeah, if you believe that this house belongs to the Lord God and something is wrong, you know what you do? You call the owner. And he'll he take makes care the of it. Way. He makes and he'll the make, way. That's yeah, it. He does. It may sound silly, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Okay? But we have to give up everything for Jesus. Yes. That we might gain all. That's what Paul talks about in Philippians. He said he gave up everything. He counted everything as garbage that he would have the fullness of Christ. And when he says all, he means all. He's talking about your family. Yes. He's talking about your children. Mm -hmm. He's talking about your very own life. Yes. It all belongs to him and you know what you can trust him with those things totally. because there's nothing that you can think of that he can't take care of better right. than you can take care of it right. and that includes your family your children your house your car your everything that the Lord who is doing this work in us and he is mm -hmm. it says the work he began in us he's able to complete in us he's the potter we're the clay we just lumps the clay and he's molding and shaping us into what he desires us to be. And you know what he desires us to be? Paul said it in Romans 8. He said, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. He is molding us into the image of Christ Jesus. Don't fight it. Sometimes it doesn't feel pleasant. Pow! He starts molding that clay. But you know what? He's doing the work that you need done in your life. Yes. Okay. And you know what you do when you... Uh, take that clay and you mold it and you make it and you get it where you want it. You know what you do next? Put it in the fire. <laughs> fire. Put it in the fire. That's, Holy fire. Because that's God's plan. He has a plan and the process is mm. fire. Fire is used to purify gold. Job, in the book of Job, he said, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. You know, he went through all this stuff. I don't think that any of us, I know none of us at this table can say we've been tried like Job has. But he, but Job got to the place where he understood and he said, I know that when I've been tried, I come forth as gold. And you know how you refine gold? Fire. Because when you heat gold up and heat gold up and heat gold up, you know what happens? The impurities float to the surface where they can be scraped off. That's, that's refiner's fire. That's the refining process. So God does that in our life. I can re remember many, many, many years ago. Many, 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 many years ago. No, you're old, brother. I'm old. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Almost the I'm getting years. older by the minute, even as we sit here. But it was like, you know, I had, I had, I had, I pray that I still have, I have even more a desire to be what God wants me to be. And nobody, I mean, people may look at me and judge me. They do. But you know what? Nobody will judge me or, or, or examine me as harshly as I do. I know what impurities exist in my life. So I'd see things, and I'd say, oh, Lord, help me, Lord. Help me take this out of my life. And the next thing I know, it's getting worse. That's right. Because he's putting fire into me, and that thing was rising to the surface where he could remove it. God is good. I'm telling you what. He knows what he's doing. Okay. From the, the Greek word... Catharsos, which is used for being purified in Matthew 5 8, we get the English word cathartic, which is a purgative used to clean out the body. The purpose of this study is that the word is a cathartic that God will use to cleanse our hearts, to purge our hearts of the things that don't belong there. Unite my heart to fear thy name. That's what it says in the Psalms. Because you know, we, we let our heart get divided when we start treasuring things that are not mm -hmm. God. You know, this may rub you the wrong way, but all means all. Yes. 
Yes. To love the Lord with all your heart means there's no room for anything else. That's the deal. You know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel? If you don't, you can go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Because the people of God had become so impure, so rife with, with sin and disobedience and rebellion to God, that Elijah would come into the land. He'd been out for three and a half years where God withheld the rain, right? And when he came back, he would say, I alone am left. He didn't see anybody else around living the, living the Word. Now God told him, 7,000 have I kept who have not bowed their knee to Baal. He, but that 7,000 is not a lot in Israel at the time. Okay? So God calls Elijah the prophet to come back and use him to deal with this situation. He calls together the people. And now remember, the, the king and queen of Israel at this time, Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel. They're, they're actually, they were evil. Mm -hmm. And they're taking care of the false prophets. They're, they're the bad guys. So Elijah calls for the people of God to come up to Mount Carmel and the false prophets. And in the boldness of the Lord, he says to the false prophets, the prophets of Baal, he says, call upon your God, build an altar, and call upon your God to, to burn, to take that offering. And I'll do the same thing. And whoever is God answers, he's God. So the prophets of Baal, they dance around, they cut themselves, they do all the pagan stuff, nothing's happening. So Elijah, in his godly fashion, says, what's the matter? Your God asleep? Your God on vacation? And after they give up, he tells the people, now remember, there's been a drought in the land for three and a half years. One of the most precious things in the land is water. He takes an offering. He has them rebuild an ancient altar and put an offering on the altar. And then he says, now go get water and pour water on the offering. Now, he's going to call God to burn this. Normally, if you're going to burn something, don't you don't want to wet it down first. Right? Let's make this a real challenge for God. So they build this altar. They rebuild the altar. They put the offering on it. And Elijah calls on God to send the holy fire. And God sends the fire. And in 1 Kings 18.38, it says this, Then the fire of the Lord fell. And consumed that burnt offering. And the wood. And the stones. And the dust. And licked up the water that was in the trench. Our God is a consuming fire. It all went. A consuming obsession. Your relationship with God should fill your life. Fill your heart. Fill your mouth. It should be an obsession in your life. Listen, I, I know lots of sports fans. I mean, I, I'm not saying, I'm not the only one who sits there and says, is there anything wrong with sports? Until it becomes the obsession of your life. And I've been there. God should be the only obsession of your life. And He will let it go and touch where He wants, starting with, then starting with your family, the ones that you love, but love Him more. So that fire consumed the offering. Which might make it, if you know scriptures, that might make the next verse I'm going to read to you a little scary. Which is from Romans chapter 12. Where Paul said, I, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You're going to, God, Paul is saying, moved by the Holy Spirit, offer yourself a living and holy sacrifice. Sacrifice don't survive. I mean, the, the, what's offered doesn't survive the sacrifice. Doesn't doesn't survive the fire. So is this really what God wants? Well, think about John the Baptist sent as a forerunner to make way the path ready for the Lord. Right? John the Baptist said he answered and said to people, "As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming." Who is mightier than I? I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandal, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's what it says. The sacrifice gets consumed; it becomes nothing, so that it might become everything. I remember not long ago, couple. Well, I can tell you it was two years ago. You know, I'm 72 now. And on my 70th birthday, we had been overseas. We were overseas, and I think we had been on a continent in Europe. 
And we came back for a conference at Arthur Burt's. A wonderful thing. And in the midst of this thing, I just, I, all of a sudden I had this sense. I, as I say, I realize how short I fall of where I need to be. And I was thinking about God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing in seven days. He even took a day off. And yet here I am, 70 years old, and he's still working on me. I'm not finished yet. So I'm having this conversation with the Lord in the midst of this conference. And I said, Lord, what's up? Why? How come you could do all that in seven days and here you've been working on me for 70 years and I'm not done yet? And he said, because you're not nothing yet. He creates out of nothing. When we are willing to become nothing, we will become everything in Jesus Christ. That's a fact. When we are the clay that says to the potter, mold me, shape me, change me, make me what you want me to be. Then, and I want you to remember, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to know something? I love walking in the blessings of God. And it says in Deuteronomy 28, if you obey God, you'll walk in his blessings. He'll bless you coming in. He'll bless you going out. He'll bless you in the city. He'll bless you in the country. He'll bless your kitty cats and puppy dogs. He'll bless your work. He'll bless your family. He'll bless everything in your life. Right. I want that. I want to go to heaven. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said he's preparing a place for me. Right. But you know what I really want? I want to see God. Amen. That's the goal. Heaven's not the goal. God is the goal. Amen. That we would be basking in the very presence of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Take time. Take some time. And be honest. Just you and the Lord. Get together with you and the Lord. Say, Lord, if there are things in my heart that shouldn't be there, Lord, show me. Bring them to the surface where we, you and I can deal with them. I want to be obsessed with you. I think it was Oswald Chambers wrote about a magnificent obsession. God should fill your heart. He should fill your mouth. He should fill your life because there is nothing more satisfying. There is nothing better. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, praise God. <laughs> Time here in Southwest Virginia goes as fast as it goes every place else that we are. Oh my gosh. So we have zipped. Right through another program together. It's been a blessing to be with you. I pray that more than having heard what we're saying here, that you would go and have a conversation with the Lord and hear what He has to say to you. Because it's only what He has to say to you that will change you. So take time and do that. So until next week, I just want to pray, Father, that you would make, that you would give us such a passion, such an obsession for you, such a desire for you. You said in, in, in Psalms that, if we delight ourselves in you, you'll give us the desires of our heart. We want you to be the desire of our heart, Lord God. So we just praise you and thank you for being our God and calling us to be your people and doing the work in us that needs to be done. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, Father. Amen. And goodbye till next time. God bless you. So I cherish not all Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a cross.